Pastor. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, I think I should start off by telling you what I do. And today I'll be talking about this notion of making space for outdoor recreation outside of parks and protected areas and how we can find places to connect with nature. Now, I'm particularly concerned with these places and spaces outside of parks and protected areas because we can do different things outside of parks than we can do in them. By and large, and certainly Alberta parks are a bit of a different beast, but generally speaking, if you wanted to go hunting or ATVing or snowmobiling, you generally couldn't do that in a park, yet we still need to find places for people to do this, particularly if they want to find backcountry areas or places off the beaten path. One of the things I do in my work is to study the relationships that people have with nature and natural resources, understanding their attitudes towards various issues, understanding um, what they think about things, their, their emotions occasionally, although I'm not, not a psychologist, but how they feel about landscape and what they can do in it and what they can do for it. And I think it's that last part, what they can do for it, that's going to be the focus of my talk today. Certainly outdoor recreation has a lot of benefits. We're going to be seeing a list that's going to be scrolling up here shortly of a number of benefits that outdoor recreation can have, both for individuals and for society. The list we're seeing here is a list of about 146 different benefits that Bev Driver has identified and put together. It's not an exhaustive list, and it's not an exclusive list either. Certainly many of these benefits can be realized through other leisure activities and other athletic activities as well. I've highlighted some of the ones that I think are particularly interesting or important in green, things like an enhanced worldview or social bonding and cohesion and cooperation, uh, public involvement in environmental decision making, and greater community involvement. It's interesting that these benefits can be held by both individuals and society. And today I'd like to focus on three particular benefits in a broader societal um, image. The first of these would be socialization. Now, recreation activities, I think, are inherently social. They bring people together to do things. We often you know, think of you know, learning how to fish with our grandparents, for example, or getting together with friends, colleagues, acquaintances to do things together, these shared experiences. And it can be you know, in our neighborhood park. It can also be in, in more distant places, as we can see in some of these pictures. But the point is that recreation activities can bring people together. And these shared experiences that they have um, helps to really maintain, foster, and strengthen these, these friendships, these ties that we have with other people. And those friendship ties, those the social bonding, if you will, are really important for functioning communities. And I think outdoor recreation plays that role in bringing people together. And when we bring people together for these shared experiences, we can produce things like social capital. Now, that's a word we've heard a lot these days, but generally, I think we can think of social capital as being social benefits. Things like information, um, support, and, and things of that nature. And I think recreation's role in producing those things is good for individuals, but it's also important for broader society as well. Standing out of that notion of socialization is this idea of civic engagement. It's certainly a benefit that, um, that outdoor recreation can provide to, the, to individuals. We, through a socialization, we get involved with people who may have different ideas that we've, than we have. It opens our horizons, it broadens our horizons, and opens us to new ideas. It brings people together for these, I guess, shared issues. Um, research I've done and others have done has shown that people engaged in outdoor recreation are more likely to vote. They're more likely to get involved in politics. At, at base levels and perhaps at greater levels. They're more likely to, to coalesce over issues um, at neighborhood scales or regional scales, whether it's to stop the development to save a park or whether it's to get together to help build a playground. Generally, the people who are doing these things are involved in some form of outdoor recreation. Now, that's not to say that outdoor recreation is this big, um, big thing that can push these things, it's just that outdoor recreation participation is fairly ubiquitous, and it does provide an opportunity for people to get together to do these things. Now, some research that I've done looking at outdoor recreation and civic engagement has focused on two areas. One would be sustainable forest management. Now, this is a relatively new idea that we can somehow assure people, and it's a market-driven initiative, so it's assuring stakeholders, assuring um, economic stakeholders, 
and social stakeholders that the forests are being managed in a sustainable way. And we can go on and argue about what sustainability means, but the idea here is that there's this way of certifying that the forests are being managed in a way that are sustainable. Now there's two um, frameworks, there's, there, actually there's many frameworks, but two in particular would be the Forest Stewardship Council and the Canadian Standards Association. And both of these frameworks um, have mechanisms for public involvement through public advisory groups. And these bring together public stakeholders to represent their interests. And typically in Canada, well, broadly North America, these stakeholders will involve motorized and non-motorized stakeholders. There are certainly lots of other stakeholders around the table representing unions, um, communities, um, environment, biodiversity, wildlife, whatever it happens to be, mining, other resource uses in the area, to try and come up with a plan that's going to be sustainable, not just for the forest, but for the landscape as a whole, and also for the communities that depend on those landscapes for things like employment and well-being. And outdoor recreation folks are likely to be actively engaged in these processes and communicate the outcomes of these processes to their constituencies and beyond. In a similar way, we can find outdoor recreation participants often involved in things like land use planning. Now this is relevant right now in Alberta with the, um, the provincial land use framework. The lower Athabasca has just been sort of finalized, they're now working in the south. But I would not be surprised to find if in Alberta, many of the participants are engaged in some form of outdoor recreation. My work in British Columbia with land and resource management plans de certainly demonstrated that, not just that the, the recreation stakeholders at the table were engaged, I mean, they would have had to have been, but that other members of the table were as well. And when the conversations shifted at breaks or whatnot to things not involved with land use planning, they would often talk about their shared experiences in outdoor recreation. And they were able to, to bond and find shared experiences that helped them deliberate in their, um, in their land use planning processes. The third benefit, and these are very large, sort of pie in the sky, but I think they're important um, benefits, would be the connection to nature. And of course, outdoor recreation takes place outdoors. It can take place outdoors in municipal parks. I'm really more interested in the activities that take place beyond cities, in backcountry areas, and, and near backcountry areas as well, sort of front country. And we can get these connections to nature as, as young children, as, as older adults, um, and everything in between. But this connection to nature, I think, is important for creating a constituency for nature. By getting involved in activities that um, immerse us in the outdoors, nature becomes that much more relevant to us. It becomes something that's meaningful. Our experiences help us to understand nature and natural processes. And I think that's really important when we talk about these larger notions of sustainability. By creating the constituency for nature, there's someone who can hold government's hand to the fire and say, whoa, that's enough. That's enough development. We need to find a balance. And I'm not here to tell you that we need to stop all development. That, that would be ludicrous. Certainly, society depends on the development of natural resources. We need that timber fiber. We need the oil and gas. We need coal for a variety of different purposes. But it's trying to find that balance. And that's the tricky part. The difficulty with the connection to nature these days, especially for young folks, like that, that kid there, um, is that there's so much competing for our attention and our time. And these things tend to be digital technologies. Rick Searle, a number of years ago, in a study of national parks in Canada, had this quote, humans seem to have gained a high degree of independence from the natural world. Humanity appears to have very nearly lost a sense of deep connectedness to nature. And we've been recently hearing about declines in park visitation. Um, parks Canada has developed some interesting initiatives to get people who wouldn't normally go to parks into parks, um, developing yurts on campsites so you can go, show up, drive up, and everything's ready for you. It's very easy. There's people who can show you how to build a campfire and cook over one. And these are sort of lost skills, but they're important ones, again, for fostering this connection to nature. Now, a number of years ago, a fellow by the name of Hobson Bryan um, suggested that recreation activities act like windows to the environment. And I, I love that idea, this idea that recreation almost becomes the interface through which people experience and begin to understand nature. Now, I've worked a lot in forest-dependent communities and talked with a lot of folks who, you know, they, they work outdoors all the time. 
But that's not the majority of people. The majority of people don't work in the outdoors. And even those that do, well, they don't often move to places like Chetwind or Fort St. John, um, high level, to, to work the night shift in the mill. They move to these places because they're close to nature. They can, from their houses often, get on their ATV or their snowmobile or put on a pair of boots and be in the front country and back country settings that they desire relatively quickly. So this does have a real drive for people. But again, it's finding this balance of resource use on the one hand and public access on the other. And it's an interesting interplay because many of the roads that are developed for, for natural resources, be they for oil and gas or for timber, provide us with much of the recreation access that we need to get to those faraway places. The difficulty becomes when we have too many of those roads that some of that backcountry condition that many people desire is no longer available. I'd like to shift gears right now and talk about land use planning and how we might start to realize some of these benefits and how we might find that balance that I've just been talking about. Now, one tool we have in, in outdoor recreation management and planning is the recreation opportunity spectrum. This is a management tool that was developed by the US Forest Service. It has an interesting history of its own. Um, but really what it is, it's a, it's a tool to look at landscapes through a recreation lens. And what it does is it describes different recreation settings that people can access, people can use to, to get at a lot of different kinds of experiences. So this recreation opportunity spectrum I'm showing here has seven different settings going from primitive on the one hand or all the way over to urban. And along this spectrum, we have sort of the more remote and the more natural and the, and the primitive end or something we might consider backcountry or wilderness and all the way up to urban on the other end. Within these settings, we can also find different kinds of experiences or sort of a basket of experiences we might in, that will, and these things will vary depending on where in that spectrum we are. Certainly this degree of naturalness is one of them, but there's also a, an opportunity for solitude. Certainly you'd have much more opportunity for solitude on the primitive end of the spectrum than you would in the more of the urban one. There's also this notion of um, remoteness and self-reliance, and also the numbers of people we might encounter. So if you wanted to get away from crowded areas, for example, and experience nature and all its splendor, Chances are you're going to go to the semi-primitive end of the spectrum. There's a whole lot of other things that could be said about the recreation opportunity spectrum, but one of the things that makes it very useful is that it has these operational definitions that makes its management very easy. Well, relatively easy. Management never is easy. And I wanted to apply this recreation opportunity spectrum to look at the relationships between these different recreation opportunity settings and timber harvesting. On the one hand, these timber harvesting roads can provide us with access, but on the other hand, the development of, of these roads and the timber harvesting itself changes the landscape and detracts from some of this backcountry character that's so desirable for many people. So this project is done in, well, I did in northeastern BC, up around the town of Chetwind, um, just across the way from Grand, Grand Prairie. And you'll see this outline in, in red here. That's Tree Farm License 48, and it's administrative block four. Well, that's not so interesting, but I think what happens within this is it's a large area, it's about 300,000 hectares, and it's sort of a, a usual size for a tree farm license in British Columbia. There's a variety of things happening on this landscape. Certainly within that red area, there's forestry. There's also oil and gas. We see a number of uh, provincial parks. There's also a big coal mine just to the south of the, uh, the tree farm license. To the north in Williston Lake, well, that used to be part of the Peace River. It was dammed by BC Hydro to produce energy. So there is a lot of going on here. Um, and I wanted to find out what these relationships were, particularly with timber harvesting. I'm gonna zoom in now on that block four, and we can see here um, two maps. Um, right now they're identical, they're, they're starting in the same place. And the colors on these maps are showing the different recreation settings that are available. So we can see there's a nice diversity of these settings. We have everything from semi-primitive motorized, semi-primitive non-motorized, from roaded natural, roaded modified. Now, roaded modified is an interesting one. These are the places where we have the resource roads. You, you've often probably driven down them yourselves. And you look around, and yes, there are nature scenes, but it's, it's developed somehow. There might be uh, timber harvesting going on. There could be some oil pads. So it's not a purely natural scene, 
but it's often the, the places we drive through, the transition phase to get to, say, that country, if that's what we desire. What's interesting here in both of these maps is that there is a diversity of these recreation settings, and that's a fundamental principle of outdoor recreation management and planning, having this diversity of settings. If for no other reason, then it gives managers some flexibility to respond to recreation changes over time. So for example, if you have an aging population, you might start to need more front country areas and more accessible areas. Um, if you have a younger population, maybe and a more actively engaged population, maybe having more of that backcountry setting is an important thing as well. It really depends on the context. We did some other research in the area and asked people you know, what activities they were doing, what their preferred settings were, how often they go out, you know, your typical recreation survey. And sure enough, people were looking for that diversity. It wasn't just you had 100 people looking for different settings. Even individuals would be looking for different settings depending on what activities they were doing. Again, this isn't, this isn't news to anyone involved with recreation management. It's not, it's not really rocket science, but these are important principles that guided this research. So what I'm showing here are two different harvesting scenarios. And we sat down, we had a, a rather large team. There were uh, silviculturalists, foresters, forest managers, landscape architects, um, environmental psychologists, biologists, wildlife biologists, the whole, the whole gamut. And we sat down and thought about, well, if we could manage things differently, what would it look like on the ground? So on, the, uh, on this side here, we have the dispersed harvesting scenario, and that's really the status quo timber management in British Columbia at the time. In this sense, um, the timber harvest blocks could be no larger than 60 hectares in size, so relatively small openings on a landscape scale, um, and all the roads associated with accessing those. On the other side, this is the one we kind of developed, and we said, well, what if we did things differently? What if we concentrated our harvesting in particular areas? We'd have much larger timber harvest blocks, say 2,000 hectares. If we did that, would we need fewer roads? Would the road density drop and provide other benefits on the landscape for things like outdoor recreation, but also things like biodiversity, um, natural processes as well? These were some of the questions that were guiding this development of the scenario. And I'm going to show you some, some time lapse um, mapping now to show you how the landscape character changes, in particular, how the recreation settings change. Now, I should say that the projections I'm going to be showing you are, are model driven. We, can, we kludge together a bunch of ecological models that sort of would grow the timber and timber harvesting models that would identify the best time to go in to get the most value, when the roads would go in, when the roads would be decommissioned, and using that tree information when they grow back, when they could go back and then harvest that area. Now, timber managers, foresters operate at very large time scales, very long time scales. Um, generally, in, this, in the period of time it would take uh, an, an area of land to grow a tree twice. So in this sense, we're going to be looking at 295 years. Is this realistic? Probably not, but it allows us to test out our assumptions to see if we're getting the conditions we think we're going to be getting. And if not, it allows us to go and tinker with things to, to see if we can do that. So here's the map starting off at year zero. After five years, we can see that the dispersed timber harvesting scenario has essentially converted the landscape to this idea of roaded modified. It's a very developed landscape, and this is largely because of the number of roads that are needed to access these various parts of timber. On the aggregated scenario, not so much. We still have this nice diversity of recreation settings. Um, we can see that there's some clumping together of the uh, semi-primitive kinds of settings. And in year 15, we see, well, the dispersed scenario is fairly the same. The aggregated scenario is starting to get a little bit closer to what the status quo looks like. And we can see that after about year 45, the landscapes in both scenarios tend to look the same. There's no real discernible difference. And in fact, if you want to look at it statistically, in terms of the area of the different recreation settings, there's no significant difference between the two. We can start to see that the patterns, well, this is tricky too, because the patterns, in a one sense, they're, they're different. We have different settings in different places based on where the harvesting is, but there's some similarities as well we find that these backcountry areas, these primitive settings, tend to be at higher elevations in what happened to be 
uh, low productivity areas as well. We've lost the, the valley bottom backcountry areas to timber development. Well, what does this mean? Is this a good news? Is it bad news? Well, I'm not so sure. I think this is something that local residents need to chime in on. And in fact, they did. The, the great thing about using these maps to project management assumptions from a recreation standpoint is that most people in the communities surrounding this area had a stake in it. They, they know the area quite well. There may be a lake where they learned how to fish with their grandfather. They may have this secret trail they like to go on to get away from it all. But these places have meanings for people. They evoke emotions. And maps convey a lot of information relatively easily. People can identify, hey, that's, that's my place there. What, what have you done to it? Or, oh, thank God, you didn't go anywhere near, near my special place. But the maps convey very complex information very quickly to, to lay people. And, and that's a very useful planning tool itself. It was interesting in one of our public meetings when we were presenting this, um, the, a couple of folks um, and the biodiversity stakeholders said, so this backcountry area, that's, that's going to be really sort of undisturbed habitat. I said, well, likely, yeah. And I said, well, this, this changes the picture for us. This p presents information in a very different way. And they got quite alarmed that the biodiversity in this area was, was being lost as well. From a recreation perspective, there's a couple of messages I think are really important. One is that we really have lost the diversity of outdoor recreation settings in both scenarios. Why? Well, partly because we, we didn't identify reserve areas for recreation that we said had to be set aside for backcountry type experiences. We did that on purpose because, as I say, there were provincial parks um, adjacent to this area where you could find those primitive experiences. But we also just wanted to see, well, what happens if you let timber run amok? Well, we can see that we do lose that diversity. And that, that's an issue. So I'm going to wrap things up now. How can we find places to connect with nature? Well, on the one hand, you just follow the people and see where they go. People will tell you what those interesting places are, and they tend to congregate there. The thing about places that makes them distinct from spaces is that places evoke emotions in people. They, through experiencing particular places, they develop attachments to these places and they mean a lot to them. People will get up in arms about uh, the development of their special place and they will do anything they can to try and stop that or try and mitigate the effects of, or the impacts of that development. So what do we do to, to, once we found those places where people congregate, how do we make spaces then for recreation? And I think this is where the rubber hits the road. We can use these long-term projection tools like I've demonstrated here, and that can help us see if our management assumptions are getting us the conditions that we want. Are we getting the outcomes that we desire? And are these outcomes acceptable to the public? Because remember, these are public lands. And yes, we have on the one hand, do need to have places where we can develop natural resources. We're certainly using them. But we do need to find this balance. There's been increasing research that's been finding that perhaps sometimes in some places, forests are best left standing. They have more value to us if they're left standing. Two examples that come to mind are, um, well, one would be carbon sequestration. Um, trees on the landscape take in carbon from the atmosphere and have play a role in this whole notion of climate change. If there's too much of the carbon in the atmosphere, that's the problem. Does deforestation play a role in that? Yes. Is it a big role? Well, compared to other things, probably not, but it can certainly play a role. And there's a lot of money now to be made in selling carbon credits for carbon sequestration. The Nature Conservancy of Canada has done this um, in their Darkwoods property in southern BC, and they, they bought this large area of land. They sold the carbon rights to it, and they made what they spent and more. So there's an economic argument to be made. But there's also a health and well-being argument to be made about preserving forests. It has to do with this notion of, well, what's it called? There's a long tradition in Asia called forest bathing. This notion that being in the outdoors, being in forests, can have restorative effects. And we've seen some of this in, um, in Western research. Um, Roger Ulrich at Texas A&M has done work looking at the effects of natural scenes on people's recovery from surgery. People's productivity um, at work increases if they driving through a, a treed scene, for example, or driving through a, a park. 
their productivity at work increases. So it's not new in a sense to us, but um, Asia has a much longer tradition um, in many of the countries, you know, Japan, Korea, Asia, uh, sorry, Japan, China, all have this history of forest bathing. And Western science now, and they're starting to do controlled studies, say, well, is it, a, is it a real effect or is it a placebo effect? And they're able to measure physiological changes in people by being exposed in forests. And I think this is, I think it's, it's fascinating and it's really, it could be a game changer. So it's not just recreation, it's being outdoors, it's the places we choose to go not just to realize these benefits of socialization, um, civic engagement, and connectedness to nature, but there's also some health and well-being benefits that we can accrue as well. And I think those are going to be increasingly important. I thank you very much for indulging me. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you this evening, and uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you.